Welcome to 24 Hours of PASS, Evolution of the Data Platform. We're excited you could join us today for Jimmy May's session, SQL Server 2016, Always On Availability, Availability Group Enhancements. This 24 Hours of PASS event consists of 24 consecutive live webcasts delivered by expert speakers from the PASS community. The sessions will be recorded and posted online after the event. To access any on-demand sessions, please visit www. 24HoursOfPass.com for all session links. My name is Andy Yoon. I'm a database administrator within Sono, a managed IT services corporation. I am also a regular speaker at Regional SQL Saturdays, user groups, and co-chapter leader of the Chicago Suburban SQL Server user group, and I'm also your moderator for today. I have a few introductory slides to go through before I hand over the reins to Jimmy. If you require technical assistance, please type your question into the question pane located on the right side of your screen and someone will assist you. This question pane is also where you may ask any questions throughout the presentation. Feel free to enter your questions at any time. Jimmy will address your questions at the end once we get to the Q&A portion. I will read your questions aloud to the speaker. You can zoom in during the presentation by using the zoom button located on the top of the presentation window. Please note that there will be a short evaluation at the end of the session. Your feedback is very important to us, so please take a moment to complete it. Next slide. I'd like to take a moment to thank our presenting sponsors, Microsoft, Amazon Web Services, Hortonworks, and Redgate. In addition, I'd also like to thank the supporting sponsors for this event, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, SQL Century, and SanDisk. For more than 25 years, SanDisk has been expanding the possibilities of data storage. As a vertically integrated storage solution company, they are able to quickly deliver innovative, high-quality solutions with less time from research to realization. From handheld devices to hyperscale data center, SanDisk storage solutions make the incredible possible. This offering of 24 hours of pass would not be possible without their generous support, and they are the reason this event is available you charge. Do make sure to explore everything else PASS has to offer data professionals. You can join local user groups around the world, special interest groups, find free online resources through our learning center, and read up on the latest community news in the Connector newsletter. This session is presented by Jimmy May. Jimmy's been working with SQL Server since the late 20th century. He is a Microsoft certified master working currently as a solutions architect at SanDisk, where he flips the faster bit at Fusion IO's data propulsion lab. Jimmy worked at Microsoft for nearly a decade, including several years on the SQL Server Customer Advisory Team, or more commonly known as the SQL Cat Team. You may know him best by his Twitter handle, at AspiringGeek. And without much further ado, here is Jimmy with SQL Server 2016, always on availability group enhancements. Jimmy, take it away. Thanks so much, Andy, and thanks everyone for joining us this morning or evening or wherever you are. And uh, let's set some expectations before we begin. This is not an availability groups deep dive. It is a high-level overview of HADR and availability groups, and the primary focus is a survey of new and enhanced availability group features in SQL Server 2016. I hope to present something similar at the PASS Summit where we will have live demos and uh, that'll be pretty exciting if we get the opportunity to do so. Anyway, I hope that's what you've showed up for, this survey of new and enhanced features. Some of the slides have lots of information, links for reference, I'll not be reading them to you, but you can download the deck and follow up on your own. And of course, you can always follow up and ask me questions. And uh, oh, by the way, my company asks me to show this slide to you. It's a part of the Lawyers, the Lawyers Full Employment Act of 2009. Enough about that. Again, this is uh, going to start with an HADR overview. We have lots to cover. The primary component of the deck are, is a survey of features. And the thing about which I am most excited about, this won't surprise any of you who know me, is the performance aspects, uh, where I'm saving the best for last. Look, you do not have to be a rocket scientist to look at the difference between the blue bars for SQL 2014, the red bars for SQL 2016, and see that something very, very exciting is happening. And folks, I want to be clear, these, the experiments that I will show you 
were done with the very, very same hardware. The only difference is 2014 versus 2016. In other words, just upgrading to 2016 flips the availability bit, the availability group's faster bit. Pretty exciting. And uh, hey, we have a lot more than that. And we're going to follow up, finish up with a call to action. How to use this deck. For a full copy of the PowerPoint deck, not just a PDF, you can contact me directly because there are lots of slide notes and several hidden slides. And uh, to navigate this deck, simply take advantage of PowerPoint's uh, sections feature, as I've demonstrated how to do here. And again, this is part of the deck. You can see for yourself if you've not used this feature before. Oh, oh no, not again. Quick, somebody call the help desk. Okay. Even after only a few moments, many of you, probably all of you, have figured out this is a screen scrape, or you wouldn't be able to hear me, much less see this. But seriously, has anybody ever had one of these? Well, of course we have. Do you have a plan to recover from something like this, or worse, for all of your production servers? Let's start with a brief and high-level overview of HADR. So what's your plan? I saw this in a deck presented by my former colleague, Sanjay Mishra of SQL Cat. And I just got back from the SQL Skills Immersion event, i.e. Hater in Chicago. I hooked up with Andy, my moderator, our moderator, while I was there. Since the attendees at i.e. Hater were from companies foresightful enough to send them to such world-class training, most of them had a pretty good HADR plan in place. However, However, I have heard plenty of war stories from others, and as a former consultant, I have my own to share. Believe me, HADR strategies not much better than this are out there. So what is HA? Succinctly, it's the ability of a system to service an application or, or service to maintain business continuity and disaster recovery, the plan to return to normal operations after a catastrophe. Simply stated, but can be complex in implementation. It's important to get business continuity right. Folks, anything at the intersection of people, processes, and tech can be complex. HADR has many components and may not be easy to implement. Backup? What backup? It's a serious question in some, at some places that I've been to. A fundamental aspect of an HADR strategy is your backup and restore protocol. Folks, stop me if you've heard this before. Kimberly Tripp's famous words of wisdom. You don't have a backup until it's been restored. Sadly, many production systems remain exposed, not even leveraging this most basic component. While using the Twitter to invite folks to my session, at SQL Lensman, hey guy, I hope you're out there, brought this cleverness to my attention. Schrodinger's backup. This, this, this epitomizes in a very clever way Kimberly's uh, words of wisdom. The condition of any backup is unknown until a restore is attempted. And it's true. If you're one of those folks not restoring your backups, stop it. Or perhaps I should say, start it. And that brings us to my friend, former MSPFE Ward Pond's 12th law. Folks, if you're ever faced with a, a resume refreshing event, <laughs> be rehearsed and be ready to rock it. Good luck. With that, that's our high level, I warned you it would be high level, that's our high level overview of HADR. Now let's get this show on the road with a brief overview of AGs. Again, this aspect is high level. The main part of the deck will be focusing on the new features. This presentation, as I said, is not an AGs deep dive, it's an intro. The focus will be a survey of new features, but first, here are some high level characteristics, and I'm guessing most of you are are already familiar with these already, and I'd like to emphasize a couple of things. First of all, non-shared storage is a hugely important aspect option of AG architecture. Non-shared storage, especially local, can result in significant performance, significant infrastructure, and significant cost benefits. The group, an availability, availability group, refers to the coordinated failover of multiple DBs, unlike database mirroring in which only one database can be involved per mirror. Also, multiple secondaries are common. Failover can be imp implemented in sync or async commit mode, and automatic failover can be configured. One other commonly used option are some secondaries can be rendered read-only, which expands our opportunities in the business. Okay, 
we have some uh, terms to explore before, before we go on. And uh, let's talk for just a moment about the term always on itself. Historically, it's been a marketing term reflecting a spectrum of features. And uh, something new, uh, the marketers, <laughs> those fine folks at SQL Server have uh, given us, is that there's a, a, new, a new terminology, so to speak, in, uh, in always on. In SQL 12 and SQL 14, always on FCIs and AGs, the always on was spelled without a space. But guess what, folks? They introduced a space. So consider this new, improved, quote, unquote, feature, your very first one to learn about today. And for more hilarious insight on this decision, check out our friend Alan Hertz's uh, blog post. Bless his heart. OK, some more uh, on to more serious terms. This presentation assumes you're familiar with these terms, at least fundamentally. And I want to emphasize, of all of these terms, the term replica includes the primary and all the secondaries. So all of LW groups, all AGs, have a primary, an active instance, read-write, plus one or more secondaries. Now this is very important. All of these, the primary and the secondaries, are referred to as replicas. If you have, for example, one primary and two secondaries, you have three replicas. You can avoid a lot of you can avoid a lot of confusion by using these terms precisely. We have uh, some other AG components and concepts, and uh, they were introduced simply for the sake of a complete list. We won't say much about these in this presentation, though later I'll have something to say, something new to say regarding endpoints. So let's move on to some architecture. Again, a high-level overview. Classic Windows Server Failover Cluster. This is the way we used to do it in the old days, and it still can be done this way, but we'll, uh, we'll see why it may be uh, other options could be uh, better for your environment. So we, we start out with our clients. We have a public network. There is our four node cluster, and they communicate with each other via a private network. So what about the storage infrastructure? Well, we have redundant switches. This is about HA, after all. We have inter-switch communication. We have storage, often on a SAN, shared storage. Fiber between the cluster node and the switches. Fiber between the switches and the storage. Redundant fiber and more redundant fiber. Note that the SAN in this example is a single point of failure. There are, of course, ways to architect around that, but that adds, adds to complexity. And with complexity comes expense. So let's contrast that with a typical availability group architecture. Note that the first four components are exactly the same. Clients, public network, the availability group nodes, and the private network. So where is the storage infrastructure? Well, it can be local to each node. That's one of the great options that availability groups provide us. And advantages of this design include that storage is no longer a single point of failure. There's much less infrastructure to manage and it's therefore less expensive. Note that a common upgrade strategy is to move from SAN attached legacy servers to brand new commodity servers within Server Flash. As we'll see in a bit, whether your storage is in server or on a SAN, you must have a fast storage subsystem to keep up with the exciting new performance enhancements in Always On AGs. So stay tuned for that. Uh, typical, prototypical architecture of AGs with local non-shared storage. We have a primary. We have a local secondary, typically involved in sync replication. We have a geo-distributed secondary, also because it's close enough for performance reasons in, in sync mode. And we have, on the left coast, in this example, a geo-distributed secondary with async replication. AGs are eminently flexible in their configuration. The options expand even more if we choose to add failover cluster instances to, to the mix. Again, with complexity comes expense. And the best practice, before you get started building your own always-on availability group architecture, prep your environment with the latest and greatest hotfixes, updates, service packs, and cumulative updates including the essential ones, which you can find here. With that, folks, it's time to get this show on the road. We have a long list of features. 
to go through. This and everything that follows reflects the incredible effort the SQL Server Program Group has have invested in this product. And that's why we, we can only do a survey and not a deep dive in an hour. The outcomes, seriously folks, the outcomes are impressive. And I am most excited, as I have shared, and again, no surprise, about the incredible perf enhancements. I've saved the best for last. Let's dive in. Let's talk about some dependencies. First of all, we are dependent, so to speak, on 64-bit uh, only. SQL Server 2016 will not be released in a 32-bit version, and folks, I think that's a good thing. There is no dependency on the .NET Framework 3.5. How many of us have started to uh, do an installation of SQL Server and say, yikes, the .NET Framework 3.5 isn't on this box yet. And I refer again to Alan Hurt's blog, SQL HA. And this one's huge for a lot of us, very exciting for me. AGs are now, and this may be news to some of you, AGs are now for the first time supported on SQL Server Standard Edition. And I have more about that in just a second. And some of you are going to love this one as well. Unbelievably, AGs no longer require membership in a domain. I have a separate slide on this as well. So let's talk about SQL Server Standard Edition support. Database mirroring, DBM, was marked for deprecation in SQL Server 2014, but in 2012 and 2014, AGs required SQL Server Enterprise Edition. So what's the path? Are we all going to pay uh, for Enterprise Edition licenses for simple HA and DR? The marketing team, though we uh, had a little bit of fun with them earlier on regarding the naming, the new name for Always On with a new space, the marketing team is responsible for this very new and exciting change. They have announced, because it wasn't a, there was no technical reason, not that a SQL Server couldn't be supported on Standard Edition, they have announced support for availability groups in SQL Server Standard Edition starting in SQL Server 2016. Hey, the functionality is, is limited. In fact, it's reminiscent, much like database mirroring. Two nodes, the secondary node cannot be rendered readable. It is only for, for HA slash DR. And each database must be in its own availability group. And if you want a comprehensive walkthrough, check out our friend Brent Ozar's um, uh, post here. It's a step-by-step, -step, hey, this is how you guys can do it yourself at home in your copious free time. So um, let's talk about the, uh, another dependency that I mentioned, pretty exciting for a lot of us. Um, the fact is many enterprises have multiple domains. They may or may not be trusted, and some installations may reside in a work group. Remarkably enough, it's true. I've seen them all the time. Um, SQL 2012 and 2014 provided a single options, all nodes in a single domain. SQL Server 2016 expands these options significantly. In addition to all nodes in a single domain, we can have all nodes in multiple domains, domains that are trusted, or nodes can even exist in domains with no trust. And as I have suggested, nodes don't even have to be in, in a domain at all. Now, there are some prereqs here that are, uh, let's call them non-trivial. Uh, not rocket science, but non-trivial. And in order to get started and, and getting going in the right direction on this, our friend Kevin Farley, longtime and esteemed member of the SQL Server Program Group, has, has put together a walkthrough. Uh, he's put together some PowerShell scripts in order to help us facilitate uh, fulfilling the prereqs. Pretty exciting stuff. Thank you, SQL Server Program Group, which, by the way, it was, this wasn't just the, the SQL Server program, program Group. The PG worked hand-in-hand uh, uh, hand for over a year with the Windows Program Group as well in order to get this done and implement it successfully. So good for them. Hey, we have got some enhanced Azure integration as part of the new SQL 2016 features. Uh, Azure is commonly used for async secondaries. And uh, there's a simplified Add Azure Replica Wizard. Before, we had to configure the listener manually. Now it's an automatic config. Makes it easier for a lot of us. And uh, uh, that's uh, just a little bit, you know, throwing, throwing Azure some love. Inter in Azure integration all the way, baby. We have some security enhancements uh, that I've rolled up here. These weren't found in one place. I rolled them up and amalgamated them. And so uh, these features include full support for encrypted databases. Group managed service accounts, boy oh boy, this was a connect item and uh, it got a lot of attention. <laughs> and uh, Microsoft once again stepped up to the plate and resolved it. 
Uh, so GMSAs are now supported. This helps you manage uh, services on related servers uh, with the ease of Active Directory without having to go and physically touch each server individually, which was it's what we used to have to do in SQL 12 and 2014. So thank you, Microsoft. And endpoint encryption has been improved from RC4 to AES. For those of you security geeks out there, you know what a big change this is. So once again, we can thank uh, the program group for giving us uh, new improved services. Failover is our next topic to visit in terms of new features. Uh, automatic failover partners supported has been increased for up to three replicas in, uh, previously. Failover support automatically could be done only with one primary and one secondary. Today, released in SQL Server 2016, which is going to be released any day, June 1st to be precise, we have automatic failover support for up to three replicas. Nice to have that, that option for us. DB failover provides now more granular support. We can, we're not just relying on the instance to fail over, but we can say, hey, if this database becomes unavailable for whatever reason, <laughs> then I want to, to trigger a failover. So I think some of us are going to take advantage of that increased granularity. Our next topic, we won't dwell on this for very long, is DTC support. DTC is now supported fully, so now AGs are compatible with, and th th this is a big gap that's been filled, link servers, remote procedure calls, distributed transactions, etc. The fix, a uh, little bit of technical stuff here to explain it, and um, more information if you'd like to read up, for it, uh, read up about it on your own. Uh, a point of information, you can't currently alter an existing AG. You need to, these, this only works with uh, brand new, shiny new uh, AGs you create from 2016. Little point of information that might be useful. Okay, another piece of information as we ro rock and roll through the new enhancements, direct seeding, and I bet this is news to most of you. Back up and restore, um, either explicitly or within the AG setup itself, was explicitly required to configure AGs or add new secondaries in 2012 and 2014. But now we have, quote, direct seeding. Um, and it's simply a configuration option in, in the, the um, setup. And uh, there's no backup and restore. The database is, with this option enabled, automatically set up on the secondary. Uh, internally and without explicit backup and restore. My colleagues and I at the Data Propulsion Lab will be doing some testing on this, and I've created a connect item asking for some of the backup and restore knobs we all know and love to be incorporated, max transfer size, striped backups, and buffer count. These options are uh, hopefully easy to implement, and I know in our own work they routinely enhance backup and restore speeds by up to half. And for a big database, you're talking um, even on flash. Uh, significant amounts of time, and uh, goodness forbid you're you're uh, restoring a VLDB on something that isn't Flash. Okay, another new feature that I think is going to be new to some of you people, and uh, about which some people are already pretty excited: distributed availability groups. So think about associating two availability groups from different Windows failover server clusters, for example, in different data centers. You can think about this as an availability group of availability groups. Let's look at a little, di little diagram. On the left we have an availability group in, let's say, a data center. And on the right we have a, a Windows Server Fillover cluster hosting an availability group in a completely different data center, for example. Uh, note the flexibility of this config. Then in this example we have three replicas in the main DCs AG, two replicas in the DR sites. AG. Uh, so what's the point here? Why, why do this? Well, we have more efficient data transmission. In uh, this configuration weren't distributed. We would have to have two streams going to each of those uh, each of the replicas on the right. So the primary would be sending one stream to the uh, to the 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 AG marked primary on the right, and would send a separate identical stream to the the replica marked secondary on the right. This way we consolidate the streams. And uh, so that more efficient data transmission is something that a lot of people are going to appreciate. And uh, note though, when you do, do this configuration, that the primary in the second AG becomes read-only. So all of these um, 
uh, are read all of the, all of the secondaries, all of the nodes except the main primary and the main data center are are functionally secondaries. You can flip the readable bit so you can turn them into readable secondaries, but the point is you can't read and write to the primary in the data center on the right. It's a pretty interesting configuration. Again, this was done in cooperation with not only the SQL Server Program Group, but the fine folks at the Windows Program Group. And uh, again, I know that some of you will appreciate this option. For more info, check out uh, this BOL article. And also, our, again, our friend Alan Hurt, he's not called SQL HA for nothing, has a post pending on this. Again, something new that I'm sure that uh, I bet no one out there has heard about because we just learned about it pretty recently. As far as I know, this has not been published. Uh, my friends and I, Brian Walters, Neil McLeod at the Data Propulsion Lab, observed some interesting behavior and asked the product team about it. Uh, I have a slide demonstrating this in the perf section. And so thanks much in advance to our friends at the SQL Server PG, Girish and Wayne. We appreciate the insight here. So in SQL 2014, by default, and there was no way to flip this in the GUI, all log transport is compressed for both sync and async secondaries. In 2016, we'll check out these defaults. They have uh, decided on our behalf to compress uh, every all log traffic in async mode to, uh, to keep uncompressed all log traffic in sync mode. The thinking here in sync mode, not to compress the log traffic, is to conserve CPU. Uh, so why compress in the async mode? Well, this is to maximize performance across across the wire. Uh, that's the thinking, and uh, it makes sense to me, but it just took us by surprise. Uh, these default behaviors can be modified via trace flags, and uh, again, Garish and Wayne uh, shared those with us, and here they are for your own viewing pleasure. And uh, so this is, again, something you can do on your own time for fun and for free. Um, have fun. And we will be p seriously playing with these, playing with these, experimenting with these options, and uh, publishing some data for you if you don't have time to do it on your own. Readable secondaries is our next step on this journey through new features. Um, lots of new stuff in readable secondaries. Uh, they are what they say. I've mentioned them a couple of times throughout this presentation. Uh, so what is a readable secondary? Um, again, they are what they say. There have been a lot of ex exciting enhancements. It's simply a secondary, a secondary replica that's been configured to accept connections for, you guessed it, select queries, as well as backups. We'll cite some of the enhancements in readable secondaries, and we'll also share some things that you need to be aware of if you implement readable secondaries. Round robin load balancing. We all don't have F5s in our, in our um, environment, and so we can configure uh, road balancing on our own. Let's, let's, let's see what this looks like. Again, by default, no connections, user connections, are allowed on the secondary. In SQL 2014 and also 2012, however, we could configure read-only access on any secondary replica. Uh, you had to explicitly define those secondaries on which you flipped the readable bit. And this is, for example, to offload a reporting workload. Or if uh, you didn't want to subject your primary to the, the um, uh, performance hit that a backup might take. All right? But in 2016, we can configure a list of, quote, favorite readable secondaries. Say, a set of local instances, but configure a remote secondary to be accessed only in the, in the event of an emergency. And let's, let's look at an, exa an example. Okay, so what do we have here? We have a DR site on the left, uh, labeled Computer 5, ready to, take, uh, to host the application in the event of an emergency. But at the primary site, we have four servers. Uh, computer 1 is our primary. Our secondaries are computers 2, computer 3, and computer 4. And we have a bunch of clients. Now, note the syntax. We have a read-only routing list. Note that computers 2, 3, and 4, here listed in blue, are listed in nested parentheses. And access is round-robin based on availability. Like if um, uh, the the server in this read-only routing list that is most available gets the next connection. However, in the, in the event of an emergency, 
the DR site goes down, all connections, read and write, can be routed to Computer 5. Let's see what that looks like. A little example, there's a client going, being routed to Computer 2, Computer 4 gets a, a select query, Computer 3, Computer 4, um, Computer 2 gets one, Computer 3 gets a, gets a request for a select query. This is, these are select queries from various clients throughout the enterprise, and since there are only selects, no modifications to the data are required because of the way the AG was configured. They are round robin uh, between computers two, three, and four, the second the readable secondaries. Now, oh my gosh, failover occurs, a real failover, unlike the blue screen you saw earlier. <laughs> and uh, what are you what are you what are you gonna do? Well we're gonna call on computer five. So now you see that computer five is in the read-only routing list outside of the nested parentheses. Now computer five gets all the connections. Okay? It's as simple as that, folks. It, this is truly, it may seem arcane and may seem trivial. I think for a lot of enterprises are going to take advantage of this option. Thank you, Microsoft, once again. So bottom line, during the normal course of business, we can route in round-robin fashion select queries to a set of preferred secondaries. It is, sim it is as simple as that. But in an emergency, we contain, maintain business continuity on failover. Okay. Next, in terms of readable secondary enhanced support, we could configure an Azure, Azure, excuse me, we could configure Azure to be a readable secondary in 2012 or 2014, but this functionality has been enhanced in 20, 2016. Again, the best practice is to use async commit availability mode for this. And uh, I'm not going to dwell on this a lot more, but there is a lot more info. I, seriously, a lot of info. Uh, we, uh, you can easily get into the weeds. <laughs> like, get into the weeds by checking out this Books Online article. And lastly, in terms of uh, readable secondaries, I think this is the last topic I have on this. And this, folks, is pretty exciting too. <laughs> yes, it's true. I really am excited about a lot of these features. So, digress for a second. Clustered Column Store is, in my opinion, and that of my colleague at the Data Propulsion Lab, Brian Walters, the single most exciting feature to have come out of SQL Server 2014. And this isn't just because Clustered Column Store is writable, which is cool, but because of the largely underappreciated enhancements to the optimizer. Column Store in SQL 2014 just works in a lot of cases where it just didn't in 2012. So, and by the way, a lot of folks don't know this. It's, uh, column Store is one of my favorite things. I uh, have been evangelizing it for years. Column Store is the, is the default index of choice for data warehouse and reporting type workloads. Folks, be clear about this. Column Store isn't something you think about or try just for kicks when it comes to enhancing the data warehouse like for, for performance, analytics, or other reporting workloads. It is the index of, of choice, the default index to consider. So be aware of that. But I digress from availability groups. Clustered Column Store was supported in SQL Server 2014 AGs, but not when readable secondaries were enabled. And that's important, and this caught a lot of people by surprise. So if your Clustered Column Store, if you didn't have a read-only secondary, you just had vanilla uh, passive, quote, unquote, secondaries, you were fine with Clustered Column Store. Okay, no problem. But in but in uh, if you flip that readable bit on the secondary, because of the way, in order to mitigate blocking on secondaries by read-only queries, uh, uh, what happens is the redo thread, and we'll talk about the redo thread in a minute, applies log transactions from the primary to the secondary as the secondary receives them. In order to uh, mitigate blocking from that of that redo thread, because it's 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 important that the redo thread be able to proceed and do its work without out any blocking. All read-only queries use read committed snapshot, RCSI. And in 2014, this implementation prevented clustered column store from uh, being supported with read-only secondaries. Uh, the, best description, the best description I've seen of this is from uh, uh, Paul Randall, everyone's hero from SQL Skills, and this is really a pretty interesting, and it took caught me by surprise. I wasn't aware of this at all when I first read this. It's, a, it's a, by the way, a great interview question <laughs> if, you, if you're trying to separate the wheat from the chaff. So check out Paul's uh, pretty informative article. I've got a couple of uh, uh, 
uh, links here and also characterizing the error, including a connect item. And uh, so you want to check that out. The fix. The fix is simply upgrading to SQL Server 2016 where clustered column store on readable secondaries is fully supported. Once again, thank you Microsoft SQL Server Program Group for stepping up to the plate and getting it done. Oh, um, there is one last thing on read-only secondaries, and there are some licensing and performance implications. As I go around uh, and uh, speak about availability groups, we, um, uh, a surprising number of me, to me at least, of uh, people are implementing readable secondaries. But there are some licensing implications. Now, folks, I am not a SQL Server licensing expert. And if you are, I suggest you go get yourself a life. <laughs> you must have invested a lot of time to, uh, to get up to speed. But seriously, licensing is complex. One thing I do know, if you flip that readable bit on a secondary, you've got to license that secondary. And uh, depending on over a dozen factors, including whether it's uh, your, um, your uh, sales geeks end of quarter, and, uh, time, uh, time to, uh, time to get hit, his, hit his quota, Enterprise edition licenses for a modern commodity two-socket server can cost between $200,000 and $600,000. Seriously, a half a million bucks to license a SQL server. The cost of hardware is nothing compared to the cost of the licenses. Hey, I'm, but it's worth it. SQL server rocks, right? But just to consider the licensing implications, if you flip that readable bit, you've got to license that server and pay for those licenses. So just something to consider. In the Data Propulsion Lab, we have demonstrated some scenarios in which in-server flash supports workloads that heretofore had to be offloaded, offloaded to readable secondaries. Um, in other words, a primary loaded with flash supports the work without the perf penalty that heretofore required offloading to a readable secondary. So just consider the savings to your, your organization by doing so. Literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in licensing per server. Again, not advocating it. Your mileage may vary. Well, I guess I am advocating it, <laughs> but your mileage may vary, and it is something to consider. Uh, so moving on. Ah, another brief digression. I want to get to, I'm not going to dive on this slide in the interest of time. This is something pretty important. AG or no AGs, no chatty apps, optimize your queries, add admitting in the missing indexes, et cetera. And folks, this is especially true for writes. Writes are expensive, writes get logged. And, and if it hits the log of a database participating in an AG, it goes across the wire and is a potential performance hit. Hey, I just didn't make up this Morpheus meme all by myself. It was inspired by no less than the co-founder of Intel. So keep that in mind as you architect your availability groups and the apps on which, which reside on them. And that gets us to a very important best practice. And this isn't just new to 2016. This applies to 2012, 2014, as well as 2016. Minimize your availability group I.O. by adopting this best practice, sort in TempDB in your index statements. And I for, it made sense to me, and I've been using sort in TempDB as a best practice for a long time. But this was officially documented by our friend, our friend at SurSQL. Uh, Mr. Nick Kane in this blog post here. I communicated with him last night and he says he's got some new information for us, which I am looking forward to seeing. And with that, folks, we are doing pretty good on time, I am happy to say. We are going to dive into what is, and again, no surprise to most of you or any of you who know me, Ability Group Performance Enhancements. Now, this is a section we've all been waiting for, at least the one I've been waiting for, flipping the faster bit. So let's set the stage here. And again, folks, this is seriously of all the exciting and some not so exciting, kind of cool, but not necessarily earth shattering enhancements in SQL Server 2016 AGs. This, this feature and the things I'm going to show you, the improvements to the log transport and the redo thread will be the most impactful to most of us. So uh, wait till you see these results. Now, all the experiments which follow were, were performed with a hardware config similar to the following. A single injector to generate the workload, just a generic server. A single two-socket commodity server to serve as the primary replica. And depending on the experiment, one or two identical commodity servers to serve as secondary replicas. In some experiments, a single PCIe card was used. 
and other experiments we use too. So let's look at some test results. Oh, no, let's just, let's, but first, <laughs> sorry to keep you waiting, let's characterize the perf bottlenecks. Um, always on AG's functionality is, is based on database mirroring. There, it's a direct descendant. DBM, database mirroring legacy code, had two built-in performance bottlenecks inherited by availability groups, the log transport and the redo thread. Now, the log transport originally limited performance across the wire to only 40 megabytes per second on the, the, the conventional engine. And with Hecaton, we were able to get up to 100 megabytes per second. Uh, the ch one of the challenges with this is that changes could accumulate on the primary. Could, could, not could, they did. And while they're waiting to be copied to the secondary, as these changes accumulate, the risk of data loss increases if the primary fails. Let's look at a diagram to clarify what I'm talking about a little bit. So we have two bottlenecks. And there is, there is, in this diagram, the log transport, the process that encrypts and, and compresses log traffic to secondary replicas. And uh, the other little bottleneck was the redo thread. Think about the redo thread as a continuous restore thread, simply applying changes made on the primary replica to the databases in the secondary replicas. Simple as that. So let's look at the results. Now this this particular experiment used Hecaton, and uh, <laughs> I think after you see these results, you'll be ah, as excited as I. Who knows? But I, hopefully you'll be you'll find them compelling. We simply by upgrading. Now let's look at what happens when we flip this faster bit in SQL 2016. I need to emphasize the very same hardware was used for both of these both of these experiments. The only difference in the protocol is the version of SQL. And this experiment, this experiment demonstrates one of the most exciting outcomes of this work. All right, let's look at CPU. CPU increased by a factor of four. You might think that's not a good thing. Folks, as I mentioned, as we, we talked about licensing a little while ago, a few moments ago, uh, about a half million bucks to license a, an enterprise edition server, a CPU that's sitting idle isn't doing nothing. It's burning licensing dollars. By flipping the faster bit in SQL Server 2016, you get to take advantage of the CPUs, the license for, licenses for which you paid so dearly. So this is a good thing. But it's more than just burning more CPU. Check this out. This is the business impact. This is what your users are seeing. In this particular experiment, we had approximately six to seven times more transactions per second. And this is, this is what caused that increase, five times more bytes sent to the transport. This is the fix, folks. This is what the program group uh, buried deep in the bowels of the database mirroring slash availability group code with some complex stuff that they weren't able to fix in 2014, but they bit the bullet and got the job done in 2016, so we can thank them all for it. And no kidding, I was on the SQL CAD team when we first discovered this way back in SQL 12, 2012. In fact, my current colleague, Brian Walters at the Data Propulsion Lab, was the first external customer to bring it to our attention. We knew it was only a matter of time after we discovered it internally, and uh, frankly, it was heartbreaking for us all. Um, it took us some time to get it done, but they got it done, and they got it done right. How can you look at these numbers and not be excited for any of you who are at all into performance? And uh, this is uh, the redo thread here. There's still some work to be done. This was an early release candidate of, of, uh, of uh, SQL Server 2016. We have got some new data on SQL Server 2016, a newer build that we are going to release where the uh, log bytes received actually uh, do even a better job of uh, keeping up. Okay, and uh, not only I mentioned just a second ago about the SQL Server 2016 AG log transport improvements benefiting us in terms of uh, burning uh, more CPU, thereby, thereby providing more value in terms of licensing. Well, how do you take advantage of that? Conventional storage cannot support the kind of workload that uh, I just showed you. Um, so you have to use Flash. And here is an example of a uh, uh, the very same experiment, the very same numbers, and you see the flash uh, being leveraged 
four times more throughput without even breathing hard. And what's most exciting about this for me is not only that Flash could keep up, of course, uh, but, but the latency. Those of you who know about disk I.O. monitoring know that latency is the cardinal counter, the single, arguably, the single most important metric in, in the disk I.O. measurements. And so here's this random workload, this redo thread applying random transactions to the, uh, to the secondary, and we're getting a, a latency of 300 with microseconds in SQL Server 2014, only 700 microseconds. Folks, measuring latency in microseconds. Uh, getting half of a gigabyte, 553 megabytes per second across the wire, loading onto the secondary replica with a latency of only 700 microseconds. And in this experiment, we did this with simply two PCIe cards. How many spindles would be required to support that performance? Seriously speaking, no less than about 200 rotating rotating disks, an entire enterprise SAN, or possibly more. Um, and so this is why I'm suggesting that to take advantage of the performance enhancements that the SQL Server Program Group has given us, you need to have an environment built on top of Flash. Some more experiments. The experiment I just showed you was an experiment we did with Hecaton. Let's look at the, the cloud range. Here is SQL Server 2014. We're getting a, a consistent 50 megabytes per second across the wire. And look at 2016. Fully five times more, a quarter gigabyte per second across the network. And I, again, I want to remind you, the, this, these experiments were done on the very, very same hardware. The only difference is the version of SQL Server 2014 versus 2016. And I repeat again, simply upgrading to 2016 lets you take advantage of your existing hardware, assuming your infrastructure is capable of supporting these workloads, and it instantly flips the faster bit. Again, a common um, uh, migration strategy is to move from your current environment. Brand new uh, commodity two socket servers are pretty rocking, and uh, using using in server flash or or all flash array, for example, which for the record my company doesn't make. <laughs> The point is not not to buy stuff from my company, but to buy a performant environment that can support the features that 2016 provides. Okay, one last performance-related slide. What we're seeing here is log bytes, flushes, and bytes sent to the transport for async versus sync and SQL Server. And the point of this is to show you the cost of of benefit of of using async versus sync. Okay. Um, the async is only about 10% more performant. So if you don't flip the sync bit and you keep your your um, servers in async mode, you get about 10% more performance, at least in this experiment. However, the log bytes sent to the transport are 44% higher for sync. Why is that? Hmm. Well, remember that compression stuff, the compression options I showed you earlier? When we did this experiment, we weren't, we weren't aware of the differences. We didn't know that async was compressed and sync traffic was uncompressed in order, in order to conserve CPU. Therefore, the sync traffic appears to have generated a lot more log traffic across the wire. So we're going to repeat these experiments with um, uh, the various options, flipped and unflipped. The point is here is that in sync mode, you're, by default, you're sending a lot more traffic across the wire. Now, I, I also did add that you're getting 10% less performance in sync. However, when you're using sync mode, you are, uh, uh, you're recovered. You're not going to lose any business data, so be aware of that. So for a relatively small performance penalty, you are completely covered. Your, your transactions on the primary are sent in real time across the wire to be um, uh, safe and sound, hardened on the secondary log. Okay, I, uh, there is one more perf experiment, and let's look at it. And I like this experiment a lot because it demonstrates the consistency in, our, in the testing protocol. Three tests each, 2014 versus 2016, and um, uh, got about another minute, so perfect timing before we open it up for questions. CPU utilization in 2014 was 11% versus 37% in SQL Server 2016, over three times higher. Transactions, the work done, 
was was about twice as high. So for a little more CPU, you get a lot more business transactions done. In other words, you get all this extra perf. Again, I repeat, you get all this extra perf simply by upgrading to the latest and greatest version of SQL Server. I remind you also that you have to have the storage subsystem to support such throughput. And um, with that, our performance section is, is over. I hope you've enjoyed my <laughs> the information that I shared with you. We have a lot more data to share. Uh, just couldn't fit it all into this presentation. Uh, stay tuned for more. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to refer you to this uh, data-driven um, 11 and a half minute video from Kevin Farley. I mentioned Kevin earlier. He's the one that provided the PowerShell scripts for uh, non-AD dependent um, domains. And uh, this is a really exciting and compelling video. You can share it with your colleagues who weren't able to attend my session. And here are some references. Uh, once again, I, I point out Mr. Alan Hurt and his sidekick Max Merrick at SQL HA. Uh, my friend Ross Lafort and I did an hour-long video talking about not just always on AGs, but also Hecaton, um, online analytics, and some other consolidation advantages of SQL 2016. You can see it here, bit.ly slash mtcperf. Um, I've mentioned we have a lot more data. We'll be posting it on our blog, our company blog. Books Online is a great resource, especially for this early in the release cycle for 2016 AGs. And here's a white paper I was uh, privileged to review a reviewer on in order to help you set up your AGs if you've not done so before. Training. SQL Skills IE Hater. This is world-class training, folks. I mentioned I just got back from this uh, when I saw Andy, my moderator, in uh, Chicago a couple weeks ago. And again, SQL HA, Alan Hurt and Max Merrick. Again, they don't call him SQL HA for nothing. He's got some great training you can take advantage of. And uh, lastly, folks, I will repeat, you cannot take advantage of these new performance enhancements without a performant environment. So I invite you, don't be this guy. <laughs> And if, you, if this is your org, uh, share this session with them. Show them some of the compelling enhancements that are available. Summary and call to action. Look, folks, I hope I have presented a compelling case. Lots and lots and lots of new features, a seemingly endless list, and especially, and most exciting for us, the performance enhancements. Simply upgrading from SQL Server 2012 or 2014 to 2016 allows you to take advantage of these performance and functional benefits if you have the infrastructure capable of supporting it. And you can start today by clicking this link. Just go to the SQL Server homepage and download the RC. That's it. Hey, folks, thanks very much for your patience. Thanks for listening. Andy, at this point, I'm going to hand it back to you. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, we have a whole slew of questions, so I'm going to uh, just start uh, uh, um, hitting you with them right now so we can get through as many as possible. No so stump to one. jump. Right. Uh, let's see. Are there any enhancements in the SQL agent services so jobs will transfer as well? Ah. Uh, I said no stump to jump. Just kidding. Uh, actually, I know the answer to this, but you heard my sigh. Unfortunately, no. However, there are scripts out there. We will be following up. Those of you who registered will be getting a, a follow-up, and I will send, uh, I know my, my uh, good friend and Jonathan Cahayas of SQL Skills has done some work, and I think a couple of other people have done a nice job of that. So uh, I will provide links to that in order to do so. Next. Do we still need to create a database snapshot on a secondary replica in order to create indexes optimized for reporting? Ah. Well, we, the answer is no. We have readable secondaries that you can use for reporting. I think you're talking about explicitly indexes. My, that, is, that remains an option. If, you, if your primary cannot support the indexes you need for reporting, um, then the answer is you still have to resort to that. I seriously would consider the option of in-server flash. And I don't do this just to shill for my company. There are lots of great flash manufacturers out there. My point is to shill for the creating a performant environment that can support your workloads. Uh, in-server flash can not only possibly support the work, your workload on the primary, uh, but also you may not need these secondary indexes, or you can build them in a different way on an active server for which you haven't paid licenses. OK? All right. The same transaction log and redo thread bottlenecks fixed in 2016 availability groups 
are these same processes used in the data replication feature in SQL Server? If yes, have they also been fixed in 2016? Uh, the answer to that, I believe, is no. I have had a long and ar arguably successful career without ever uh, being directly involved in a statement of work in which the word replication appeared. However, <laughs> however, I know a little bit about replication. The mechanisms are different. The log reader that is used for transactional replication, for example, which you're probably referring to, is 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 different than the, uh, to the best of my knowledge, than the uh, log the log redo enhancements that are, have been implemented in SQL Server 2016 availability groups. However, I will make a point to when I answer the questions to follow up and get an, an explicit answer from our friends on the program group. Good question. Next. So if we are getting such a higher log transport performance in 2016, what is the packet impact on the network? I realize oh, 2016 has a lot of questions, so it might not be one to one. That is a, well, I can't, that is a great question. The reality is, folks, fiber is not keeping up. So many of us are using fiber across our, our, our uh, to transfer data across, across our uh, internal networks. The reality is more and more and more we're switching we're switching to to IP kinds of workloads. In our lab, for example, we have 40, 56, and now 100 gigabit networks. Now I get it. Out in the real world, not everybody is going to be uh, ex experimenting in or, or have 100 gigabit networks in the production environment. But there is an impact on the network. You really you seriously need to consider private networks and and considering new options as you upgrade your 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 hardware, invest in flash. Folks, remember, again, I'm not just in stealing from my company. The hardware decisions you make today will impact, you'll have to live with for the next three to five years. And and along with this, the greater performance needs, the greater data needs for business, you've got to have hardware that can keep up. This isn't just um, the the bigger new cores. It isn't just more memory. It isn't just better storage. It's also new, improved networking features. So think about that. Good question. The network is, is impacted, no question about it. All right. What do you mean when you say CPU percentage went up so much more? Does SQL Server 2016 require servers with more and faster CPUs? Oh, this is a really great question. Oh, I wish I had more time to talk about it. Uh, I mentioned I was went to IE Hater uh, last, a couple weeks ago with SQL Skills, and Glenn Berry has a really fascinating uh, uh, discussion on sizing your, your processors to take advantage of the best processor for your workload. Uh, the reality is, when you, you think about a log jam, you, you, you release the log jam and uh, more, the stream comes rushing down. The, the bottleneck in the log transport was a log jam for always on availability groups. No ifs, ands, or buts. You, when the SQL Server program group fixed that, they remediated that, they, they released they uncorked the SQL Server. They liberated the application server to do what it's meant to do, process transactions. R liberating the logjam allowed the engine to process more transactions, and that requires more CPU. I hope that answers your question. Again, when I, I uh, get the questions to follow up, I'll provide a much more detailed explanation. We have done a lot of debate on this internally. Uh, it, again, it's one of the most exciting things, to get more value for the CPU dollars for which you have paid simply by upgrading to SQL Server 2016. Very exciting. I hope I answered the question. Again, I'll go into it more deeply in the written phase. Next. So real fast, since we are pretty much out of time, could you please repeat uh, your address to your blog where you're going to be answering the remaining questions that have been submitted? Okay, you can always ask me directly, and I'll, if, I can't get the, if I don't know the answers, I'll get them. Jimmy.may at sandisk.com and I'm aspiring geek on the Twitter, it's, but the blog is itblog.sandisk.com. Uh, we, we'll uh, we are right in the middle of a really exciting experimental phase. I've, my company is limiting my travel. No more SQL Saturdays for the, for the rest of the summer, unfortunately. Sorry, Sacramento, uh, if you're on the line. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and Indianapolis, I can't even go to my hometown. Uh, in order that I can focus and my colleagues on hardcore heads down experimentation, uh, uh, tr tr uh, getting some data that is publishable and actionable for you folks out there. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Look forward to hearing the rest of the questions. Go to the next slide.
Next slide, Jimmy. Thank you. So please make sure to stay tuned for our next session, Advanced R Analytics in SQL Server 2016 using R Tools for Visual Studio with Bill Jacobs. Thank you all again for attending. I hope you had a uh, great session. Thank you again, Jimmy. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Pass. See you at the summit. <laughs>